My name is Demetrius Jaggers, and I'm the board of the Multiple Affairs of Welcome to God of the Diversity Lecture Series on Institutional and Systematic Depression. Today we have uh, Dr. Richard Serby with us. He is the department chair and professor of sociology at Case State University. He received his PhD from Indiana University in 1985. Uh, his research areas of interest are identity, self-identity, social psychology, survey research, and his expertise relies in the areas of social psychology, identity theory, family, quantitative methods, and evaluation research. So please uh, give Dr. Serby a warm volition. Before you have to go on the public. 
That's middle class by my definition today. All right? Which means that the middle class has shrunk. In 1970, that definition represented about 60% of the people who thought of themselves as middle class. In 2010, according to the current census, it represents about 7% of the people who would identify themselves as middle class. All right? So we've shrunk in terms of our access to resources and our own personal safety net to take care of ourselves. One of the values of American society is that we have the opportunity to get ahead. We have, you know, you know, self-reliance. It's a big part of it's a big part of American values. Okay? It's a big part of American values. So how do we get to a situation where we have more inequality in America than ever before? How do we have a situation in the United States today where 400 families in the United States earn more than the earn more than the bottom 50 percent of this country? Earn more than 150 million people. 400 families. How did we get there? So this question of oppression as a systematic institutional process is, 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 uh, is, is what I want to talk about. And I want to situate it, in, I want to situate it back when I was many of your age, many of the students in here, and how that's changed over a period of time. Uh, when I was 16 years old, I moved out of my family house. I was working 24 hours a week at a grocery store. It was union. I was earning $2.05 above minimum wage. I worked 24 hours a week. I rented a studio apartment. I had enough money to pay my rent, pay my car insurance, buy food, have a telephone, pay for my utilities. And I still had enough money on the weekends to take my girlfriend out. Okay. How many of you can do that working 24 hours a week? Anywhere in this country. When I graduated from college in the spring of 1971, my tuition in California State University, in the California State University campus, my tuition was $57. Today, if nothing had changed, we just went up with inflation, my tuition would have been $900. In that same campus, where I actually went back and was a faculty member for six years, it now costs $7,000 to be a full-time student. Now let's bring it back home. I'm at Kent State. In 2000, Kent State paid, Kent, the state of Ohio paid 70% of the cost of education for students at Kent State. In 2000. 2012, the state now pays 18% of the cost of tuition. Where did the money go? Where did the money go? We all know it didn't go to faculty salary. <laughs> right. We all know it didn't go to secondary salary. I have an administrative assistant who makes $14 an hour. She handles my budget, she handles all of my grades, she handles the hiring and firing of all of our part time faculty. She, um, uh, oversees uh, the building of, uh, uh, of my schedule, all those things. She has to put up with me right? for, for less than $30,000 a year. Right? For less than $30,000 a year. Right? So where's the money? Where's the biggest, where's the biggest transfer of funds in the state of Ohio in the last decade? From the state funds. Anybody have a guess? Yep, who said that? Yep, it's prisons. It's prisons. Why? Why? Are you all that unsafe? You know, the United States incarcerates more people right now. We have more people incarcerated in the United States than all other industrialized countries in the world together by 30% more than. Really? We're the land of the free. The other problem with 
the business. Who's in jail? Who's in prison? If you're an African American male, the probability that you'll spend time incarcerated in this country is one in four. Twenty-five percent. <coughs> Systematic institutional oppression. Three things fundamentally guide us. One of them is the power of public interest. In the state of California, the most powerful body in the state is the Correction Officers um, Association. If you have, if you're a prison guard in California, um, your base salary is $62,000 a year. That's with one year of community college training, $62,000 a year. But if you're a prison guard in California, you are guaranteed five hours of overtime every week because it's part of your contract. Why? Well, because the prison guards say it's, they're, I mean, it's too dangerous for them to leave their home dressed in their uniform and go to the prison and do their job and then go home and take their uniform off. So they get a half an hour of overtime before they start the shift and half an hour of overtime after they end the shift to put on and take off their uniform. Well, and the other side of this is, is that because it's always there, the state picks up the cleaning. <laughs> All the other stuff. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So that's that's pretty that's pretty important. So we put a lot of money in this country in the prison. We move a lot of money. Federal money, state money, city and county money in the jails and prisons. Why? To control a group of people who are perceived to not be in line with the predominant hegemony of the community. You know the term hegemony? Anybody? Some of the students might know the term hegemony. Hegemony is a term that means who, whoever is most in power, most predominant. It doesn't necessarily mean the majority, right? Because you know, in South Africa, there was a white hegemonic, hegemonic um, rule, and, and you know, whites are never going to be the majority in South Africa. It's who has power, and they set the they set the, the, the political standards. In the state of Ohio, we are going to continue to privatize prisons. We build them with your taxpayer money. Um, and we set the laws that are putting people in prison. In the state of Ohio, the prisons in Ohio are, are overfilled by 27%. So, you know, what does it cost to keep a person in prison in the state of Ohio for a year? Anybody have a guess? $52,712 was the figure I saw recently. You know what it costs to educate one of you in a state institution in, in Ohio, averaging from the Ohio State University, the largest university in the United States, uh, all the way down to um, Shawnee State and Central State College. The average, the average is just under fourteen thousand dollars. If we take all the costs of education, running the university, keeping the buildings warm, doing all those sorts of things. $14,000. So for every person we're putting in prison, we could pay for the entire education of four per year. So there's this set of values about what's important. Now, I'm going to tell you that things haven't changed much and with respect to this, other than we're becoming more repressive right, and more systematic. Between 1967 and 1970,
72 West Coast on 167 University campuses in the United States. Okay. Um, I was arrested multiple times for crossing state lines inside a riot. I'm a passive um, person, don't believe in violence. Um, I was never Applying it in such a way as it benefits 
sun and not us. It's absolutely okay for me to go around and, and have conversations with people about the things that I, uh, that I believe in. But it is not particularly, um, uh, not any particular change. I'm going to read you a passage uh, from something that was written in 1963. This is uh, Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail to the uh, clergy. Since we are so diligent, since we so diligently urged people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1954, outlawing segregation in public schools, at first glance it seems rather paradoxical for us consciously to break laws. One may well ask, quote, how can you advocate for breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has the moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Uh, Augustine that an unjust law is no, judge, no law at all. Now, what's the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law and the law of God. An unjust law is a code that, has, that, that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in, in the eternal law or natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality uh, is, is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because they segregate, segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and, it, and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Segregation, uh, to use the term of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, uh, substitutes an I, it relationship for an I thou relationship uh, and ends up relegating persons of status uh, to the status of things. People become things. They become something beyond being human. Hence segregation is not only politically, economically, and sociologically unsound, it's morally wrong and sinful. Uh, Paul Tillich has said that sin is separation. Uh, is not separation the existential expression of man's tragic separation? His awful estrangement, his terrible sinfulness. Thus it is that I can urge man to obey the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court for the more, before it's morally right. And I can urge them to disagree, disobey segregation ordinances because they're morally wrong. 1963. In my opinion, how much has changed? Uh, Martin Luther King went to jail in Birmingham for protesting uh, an unjust segregation law in Birmingham. And he was told by the clergy, by the national clergy, that he needed to stand down, that he was not behaving the way one would expect a person of God to behave. In that paragraph, that two paragraphs. Dr. King invoked four major theological philosophers, all of whom have talked about justice, all of whom have talked about freedom. So when we establish laws that benefit few people, we are systematically engaging institutional pressure. In 1980, we began to change our laws with respect to offshore investment, banking, lending. 
I was 27 before I had a credit card. I hasten to say that several of you in the audience under the age of 21 have a monster card, vice card, or disaster card. <laughs> um, are you credit worthy? <clears throat> Are, are you able to pay off your, your cards? See, we passed a law which changed the economic structure of this country. And most people won't think about that as a form of oppression. But here's why it is oppression. You just bought a product made in China in which the person who stitched that product got paid a dollar for the day. You bought it because it's got somebody's name on it. Hollister, I see. I saw Tommy Hilfiger someplace else. Uh, you know, you bought it at a higher rate than it, it but, but much greater than its value. Right? And you bought it on a credit card on sale at Macy's or someplace else because it was reduced from uh, reduced from its, its extraordinary value to uh, just a, 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 a little bit higher than it should be. But it was a sale, it was a deal. And so you bought it on your credit card because you didn't have the $49.95 to pay for it. You know, it was originally $79.95, you got the $49.95, you put it on your credit card, along with the meal at Applebee's, um, the other sorts of things. And now, over the next six months, you pay towards that card, and now that piece of clothing you bought, you've now paid $79.95 for it, instead of the manufacturer making the money, the banks making the money. Right. So, these laws change the way we live, and these laws essentially establish a systematic form of economic If I can convince any of you in this room to cut up your credit cards, that would be the most patriotic thing you could do. Okay. Credit is not, credit as it exists today doesn't fill this time. Because wages have been flat. Since 1970 to 2010, wages are flat. Profit has gone up. Wages are flat, profits gone up. That's institutional oppression. The other thing is, is that um, you know you hear all of this stuff about entitlement. Right? You hear all this stuff about entitlement, social security. Food stamps. President Obama's the food stamp. President, according to one political pundit, I won't call him candidate for president. Um, uh, the truth is that this increase in food stamps is, in fact, true. There are more food stamps being uh, given out than have ever been given out before. But what this political pundit doesn't want to talk about is that they're being given out to people who used to be able to buy their own food. They're not being given out to people who are lazy and who do not want to work. The increase in food stamps went up as, as unemployment benefits dropped off. At the same time, during this downturn in our economy, we've had an upturn in corporate profits. Where are the jobs? Where are the jobs? So you can say, well, we need to change the structure so that the people who create jobs, the job creators, will create more jobs. They haven't created a lot of jobs. Google has created 17,000 jobs in Switzerland 
in the last four years. Who's taking those jobs? Well, there are a lot of U.S. citizens who have moved to Switzerland to take those jobs. People who trained at MIT and Berkeley and Michigan and uh, the Ohio State University. But they're not taxpayers in the United States. Because the way they pay, they're independent contractors. And these things, these things change. Our government, our corporations are in fact creating jobs, they're just not creating them here. So, what is it about institutional oppression that would force these people to go? Someplace else. Tax rates of corporations here are in fact higher than they are in other countries on the books. Effective tax rates are not. We have to get a separation between effective tax rates and what we say the tax rates are. So, so those things can bring, bring jobs back. We just, you know. Over the tax rates, but eliminated all of the other things that reduce the tax. I pay not very much in taxes, much. I'm very blessed economically. I do better than I ever thought I would do as a child of immigrants coming from a working class family. My effective tax rate is even lower if you take what my actual income was versus what my taxable income was. I think I should pay more tax. I don't think it benefits anybody, including me. It wouldn't have any effect on the fall of my policy. Um, so we have to think about this notion of systematic oppression uh, that's institutionalized. So we have to think about our laws. We have to think about our relationships with people. We have to think about our institutions. Laws push it. Institutions benefit from it. And people pay for it. Okay, so now, how many of you think that things will get better in the next decade? people in prison? How many people have fewer people in prison? I do. You know why? It's costing too much. So we're trying to figure out ways to get people out of prison. So uh, home monitoring. Right? Uh, we're going to privatize the prisons so that when the people who, who buy the prisons and run them can't make a profit, they can close them and we can then put those people back in since most of the people in prison are there for, for uh, nonviolent offenses. They're there for, for drug offenses and for uh, status offenses. So I think the prison population is going to decline. How many of you think more money will go to education? How many of you think less money will go to education? Yeah, less money is going to go to education. And the reason is that the belief goes back to this belief of individualism. You need to be able to take care of yourself. This is America. Nobody should help you get to where you need to be. So take your loans out, you know, work the night shift, do something else to get your education. Right. So for those people who have to struggle for education, this opportunity for the great, great equalizer is but we hear all this stuff about the need for um, higher trained individuals. You know, if you listen to um, the governor's office uh, in Columbus here, they talk about the fact that Ohio doesn't graduate enough people. Well, for those of you who are younger, how many of you want to stay in Ohio after you get your degree? How many of you want to leave Ohio? That's the point. 
So the state of Ohio actually does educate enough people, but the outmigration from Ohio is high. Um, uh, I was in California when I decided to come to Ohio, and some of my friends who have Ohio degrees were like, why would you leave San Diego to go to Northeast Ohio? Right? Didn't that river catch on fire? <laughs> and, and, and being here and going into a grocery store, going into someplace else, and somebody saying, and for the first year I still had my California driver's license, because I was just too lazy to get an Ohio driver's license. And so, you know, people look and they go, oh, you're visiting? No, I live here. Why would you move from California to Ohio? Well, I'll tell you why. All of life in the state is much better than most people think it is. You know, I don't miss California at all. The only thing I miss about California is the diversity, right? My ability to decide that I'm going to eat uh, Latin food and for my choices between five or six different, quote, Mexican places that from different parts of Mexico and, you know, Guatemala and El Salvador and that sort of stuff. I can't do that here. I can go by the west side of the food and get a little bit of taste. But, um, but it's kind of hard to do that, you know, in Mansfield. <laughs> That's so why I miss that. But I don't miss anything else about California. It's a tough place to live. It's expensive. It's, it's, it, and, and it's stressful. So what happens is that we've actually sold people in this country another bill of goods. Besides the credit that you guys are living or hope to live on. Right? We've also told you that there are places where the quality of life is better. The quality of life is good in places where people have opportunities. Okay? So it doesn't matter whether it's New York City or whether it's um, Sugar Creek, uh, Ohio, or Bucyrus. I like them. Driving down the street, it's the sound of Bucyrus. Um, oh, I think I see Bucyrus. But what else makes the quality of life for us? The quality of life is this notion of how much freedom we have as an individual to pursue our goals. And what are the access points versus the barriers? And you're all been told, you've all bought into it, me too. I bought into it, I still buy it. I still believe education is a great equal. I still believe that there's a lot of opportunity for people in the United States. I'm not a pessimist. I'm a patriot. But I don't believe the people in the United States are not speaking. I believe a few groups of people who benefit from these decisions are, are uh, directing the, the, the way in which we do things in this country. And so, what makes the quality of life better is the establishment of the community. <laughs> You know, seeing so many of you come here today at this, at this campus to hear somebody talk about something you might not have thought I would talk about or were sort of interested in, is an example of community. It's an example of community. And when we start building communities and we start caring about the people around us and we start raising the quality of life of our community right, by providing opportunity, it doesn't matter what the federal government decides to do. All right, so um, uh, I want to open it up for any questions that you might have um, uh, for me about things that I've said. Oh, I meant to tell you about my rule about the remarkable. Uh, uh, you know, when I go to talks and hear things, I, sometimes people say things that I think are patently ridiculous. And I'm sure I've said something today that some of you think is kind of ridiculous. Uh, uh, my rule in my classroom is that uh, challenge, students can challenge me about anything I say that they don't agree with to turn, uh, you know, Richard, that was really remarkable. <laughs> so if, you know, if, if you want to, you know, if you want to take another position, this is the United States, right? So if you want to take another position, you know, you can, you can use the term remarkable and, and uh, do it. I mean, I could just, you know, it, these are my views um, uh, as an activist, as a sociologist. Question?
currently, and I'm sure you're aware of the main that's being targeted right now as a hydraulic fracture and wastewater well uh, site. Well, you know, I think the first time I was triggered about this, I thought about the song by John Denny. You know, Daddy, won't you take me back to Muhlenberg County? Okay. Um, uh, that's, that song is about, that song is about, in fact, strip mining for coal. Uh, and, and, you know, they destroyed that, they destroyed that, that area of West Virginia. And, uh, um, and uh, it's, it's uh, you know, we have these, we, you know, you're, you're being, I think that fracking needs to be studied. It obviously works um, in terms of, in, in terms of the stuff, but we don't know what the outcome is, which is the reason for wanting to take it. Uh, energy independence is a good thing for the United States to think about. But we've always gotten energy at the cost of some other group, right? We've always gotten energy at the cost of some other group. So we have to sort of think about how we value that. You know, um, uh, Youngstown's experiencing earthquakes from the fracking up there, right? And, um, and, and we've got, uh, I talked with a person who, um, has lived on a piece of land in Medina County. His family's been on a piece of land for 70 years. They've had their own well with water that's been great. And uh, as soon as they started fracking in Medina County, his, first of all, the water went away. There was no water, and then it came back. It came back with, it came back with odor, and it's now brown. Right? And you know what he's being told is, you know, the wells just kind of go bad. So um, uh, you have to think about that because we're essentially we're, we're, we're making laws that benefit somebody greatly and don't benefit our community. The argument is it benefits you because now you have cheaper natural gas. Really, I didn't see the co I saw the cost of natural gas go down is because there's nobody using it right now because we had we had such a warm. November and December, right? So you, you shop for gas right now, you can get it, you can get it for about for about 70 cents a cubic foot cheaper than you could in November. Because there's an abundance of it right now. So I mean I think that's I think that's the issue. How we laws how we laws allow that to happen. I mean and, and to put this in perspective, the kind of suggestions that have made uh, uh, the keystone pipe. How many of you know about the Keystone Pipeline? So the Keystone Pipeline is designed to bring, bring um, oil from Canada to the United States. The argument is going to produce 20,000 gallons. Um, we don't know what the environmental impact would be of bringing these pipelines from Canada. It hasn't been seen. And it will affect farmland. It will affect wheat fields. So we, we need to know those. And that's what, you know, theoretically, that's what this country is based on. It's based on fairness, right? And equal opportunities. So I, I don't know how to address this your issue, but, but I mean, that's my, that's my concern with respect to it. You know, I think, uh, I think science is a good thing. I'm a scientist. Um, I think learning, getting new ways for us to, to uh, get energy, whether it's wind or solar or some form of extracting fossil fuel is a good thing, but we need to do it in a way that is respectful not only of, uh, of the environment, but the other people that you know, will be impacted by it. And so, you know, you know this guy in Medina, if they, if, if they came and said, oh, gee, we did this, this is really terrible, here's, here's fair market value for your property. But that's not what they're doing. That's not what they're doing. They can't be sued, they can't even It'll probably go broke in the process, and maybe. Anybody else have a question? Yeah. Could you um, specifically address? I have a lot of students here. Uh -huh. I have a lot of students. Could you specifically address the connection between your view of the connection between systematic oppression in institutions and genetic determinism? Wow. Good job, Scott. Um, you don't have to be complete. Well, I'm going to be complete. Yeah, in three minutes, yeah. 